Hello and welcome back to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today we're going to be taking a look at what we know so far about land and building mechanics in Star Citizen. I hope you all had a great time over the holidays. I personally survived hosting my first family Christmas without screwing anything up too badly. But now we're into the new year, it's time to get back to SC. So a quick caveat for any new players out there. Building and land are not in the game yet, but are a proposed mechanic for the future. But what I've found is that a lot of these mechanics, they've uh, been discussed at length, but due to the time that's passed, the information's become quite dispersed over a lot of sources. So I thought it'd be a good idea to do my best to bring as much as I could find together into a single video for people who are a bit newer to the game. And as a refresher for those of you who have been around for a while, I've done my best to get everything. Um, it did mean watching a lot of old videos uh, of Jared sped up a bit. Uh, but I absolutely could have missed gems of information, so please let me know if I skipped over anything in the comments. Um, I'll include links to all of the sources in the video description as well if you want to check those out in your own time. So I've split this up into the following chapters, so if you're just interested in a specific part, feel free to use the timestamps to just skip ahead. What I'm going to try my best to do is limit how much of my own opinion and speculation I throw in. So frankly, I think there's enough to get our teeth into without me hyping it up any further. At the very end, I will add a few factors that I think are particularly important to think about as we see this mechanic develop, but feel free to disagree with me, you know, civilly, and let me know what you think in the comments. I do my best to read all the comments and get back to everybody that I can. Just before we get started, if you're looking for an active community to play Star Citizen with, then please feel free to come and say hi on Discord. The link's just in the description. Uh, we do have an org, but we also have a community if you're just looking to find some friendly folks to fly with. Also, if you're a new player considering giving SC a go, I'd just encourage you to use a referral code when you set your account up, since it will give you some additional starting cash to get you going. I'll flash mine up on screen, but as I always say, it doesn't have to be mine. Just make sure you use somebody's. So with all that said, let's start by looking at where you can build and what land claims are all about. So a bit of backstory on the inclusion of land and building mechanics in Star Citizen. The idea was brought in after CIG started to include procedural planets and moons. So initially we were just going to have planets that were visible from orbit, where you requested landing and got a cutscene that took you down to the LZ. Now obviously we have whole planets and moons which are epic, uh, but run the risk of being big empty spaces. So the team are basically looking to us as players to help them fill these vast areas. The idea of the building and land claiming leans a lot on the land settlements in the US in 1889, the great venture out west with the railroads, and I really like this whole frontier vibe. So first we'll need to talk about the differences between building in UEE and non-UEE space. I'm going to just say Empire from now on because UEE can become quite a mouthful, particularly with my accent. So in Empire space you'll need to grab yourself one of these grey cap beacons to make a land claim. They come in two varieties, a plot which is 4x4km and a state which is 8x8km, so all of these are quite sizeable. Owners of the construction oriented Pioneer get an estate claim with their ship, and CIG did run a limited sale of plots and estates back in 2017, but these haven't been made available since. Fear not though, and uh, please avoid subjecting yourself to the extortionate prices on the grey market, these will be available to buy in game when the time comes. You place your beacon on a spot you'd like to acquire, then you'll need to head back to the nearest colony office or planetary development bureau to register your claim. And it's only once you've actually registered that the land's officially yours. Chris confirmed in the ATV that if two people were competing for the same spot, it would effectively be a race back to the colony office, with the first to register the claim getting the ownership. But once you've registered your claim, it's yours. So in the Q&A on land claim licenses, somebody asked, if someone destroys my beacon, what happens to my claim on the land? And the response is effectively that the person who destroys it gets a crime stat, but you might want to replace your beacon since it provides some basic monitoring. However, the colony office will keep the record that you actually own the land, so you don't need to worry about somebody coming along and stealing your land off you. As is suggested by this, um, a claim in Empire Space affords you some protections. So, both from Empire Laws and from the Navy. If you come under attack on your land, the attacking players will get a crime stat, and ultimately the Navy might show up to protect you. Tony Z does warn that the Navy can't be everywhere at once though, so depending on the security rating of the system you're in, you might have to think about some further protection. 
As the owner of this plot of land, you do also have the ability to sell it, so land's confirmed as transferable between players. Uh, but just bear in mind that just like in the real world, you're always going to end up paying some taxes. Uh, so they've talked about the idea of a title transfer, so you'll probably end up having to pay the government when you uh, realise a sale on your land. Outside of Empire Space, you don't have to worry about making an official claim, since there's nobody to register it with. And you can just go right ahead and build whatever you like on any plot of land. Uh, this may be a big win, particularly for any of you who are intending to get up to certain activities on your land that might be frowned upon by the government. However, just keep in mind that you get no protection other than that which you can muster yourselves. So anyone attacking you does so without fear of getting a crime stat. So now we know about how to actually claim land, um, and the fact that it's tradable between players, it's probably worth thinking about what determines the value of a piece of land. In the CitizenCon 2947 panel, Tony Z, the economic guru of Star Citizen, talks quite extensively about this idea of knowledge, and how it's the basis on which land is valued. So he dives into it by talking about firstly the resources present and the quantity of them. Um, sort of a fairly obvious determinant of uh, whether land's valuable or not. Sort of, do you have anything, sort of rich seams of minerals to mine? Uh, he also says about the current market value of similar land, so a bit like in the real world, sort of the value of one house is largely determined by the value that similar houses in a similar area have, uh, have sold for around it. He also talks about the level of certainty. So knowledge or information in Star Citizen is very much this analogue concept. You know things to varying degrees. So how well a territory has actually been explored will filter into its value. Has somebody just seen this from a distance, or have they gone up close and carried out proper surveys? The time at which info was last verified also plays a part. So you're more likely to pay up for info that is very current, with the amount you're willing to pay for it falling as the information gets older, and the chances of what was discovered still being present diminish. Finally, Tony looks at location. So his example here is a parcel of land containing a copper ore field. If that was located right next to a refinery, it's going to be worth a lot more than one located some distance away from a refinery, because you'd have to think about the logistics of actually getting your uh, copper to the refinery to turn it into a saleable product. So now I guess we can look at what you can actually build on your land. Um, so the vision around how outposts will get constructed has evolved over the years from the first announcements in 2017. Initially we have Todd Pappy's section of the sitcom 2947 panel, in which he explains that we'll have interior options which included habitation, armory, storage, med stations, mining and refining, and hydroponics. He then explained that there would be add-ons to help power and defend your outpost, including ore and gas extractors, solar panels, geothermal heat pumps, moisture extractors, landing pads, and turrets. In that same presentation, Tony Z also mentioned that we would have this ability to place sensors on our land just to warn us of trespassers, so some form of monitoring would also feature in there. And in these 2017 presentations, the outposts themselves were quite uniform building blocks, uh, but fast forward to the summer of 2020 and we got a sneak peek of further work on colonial outposts in the ISC taking inventory. That preluded a far larger feature as part of the CitizenCon 2951. So in these instances outposts had really evolved to get a lot more varied and building types had expanded to include shops, gas and liquid storage, warehouses, wind generators as well as solar, planetary scanners, separate communal buildings as well as housing units, cooling units, processing devices, comms towers, data storage and life support units. Wow, that was quite a mouthful. But personally I really like the approach CRG are taking sort of with these modules and I hope that they give players a huge amount of options to choose from whilst maintaining the visual integrity of the game. Don't get me wrong, people have built truly amazing stuff in games like Ark, Valheim, Space Engineers, etc. But they, those instances are often overwhelmed by blocky, ugly architecture. And while I really want players to have this option to build their base and feel that it's their own, I don't want the game to get ruined by eyesores. The approach is also a good one from a performance perspective. So in Ark and many games like it, server performance often tanks once you get to a certain point because of the mega bases players construct. 
Since each of these is built up of thousands, if not tens of thousands of little pieces, it can just trash a server really easily. It's also clear from some of the building blocks that they're talking about that the uh, base building mechanics are going to build on the survival mechanics we already have in game, and borrow to some extent from other games with more fleshed out uh, mechanics. So life support in the form of temperature control and breathable atmospheres seem to be a prominent feature. Now a lot of the habitation units like ships prominently feature kitchens. Moisture extractors should help us to support water needs, and power is a key resource for making sure all of your other systems function. So here I would imagine you have two options, either to build a completely self-sufficient off-grid base, or to rely upon shipping in certain resources such as food from elsewhere. So it wouldn't be a Star Citizen video if we didn't talk a little bit about ships, uh, so I think it's worth thinking what ships are important for building. And the first one that comes to mind is the Pioneer. This was the ship that launched the whole discussion on land mechanics in Star Citizen, built as a mobile factory able to 3D print modular outposts. How this might have changed now that the designs of outposts appear to be a bit more diverse remains to be seen. Uh, but the designers talk a lot about concepting the Pioneer in the ATV anniversary special, Consolidated Outland. They drew a lot of inspiration from modern car plants and other automated manufacturing plants, I'd keep in mind that the Pioneer offers you an opportunity to build for hire as well as building on the land that you own. Uh, this is likely to be a very significant investment, probably for an org as opposed to an individual, so there's likely to be a large number of players willing to contract out the actual building of their base to a construction team from another org. I'd also think about the importance of haulers, particularly those like the C2 which can easily traverse from space to Atmo. Something like the Caterpillar as well with its tractor beams could also be really useful for moving materials around a building site. The Banu Merchantman is one I like to shoehorn in as it's probably my favourite ship, but it's maybe my favourite ship because it's so easy to shoehorn into so many situations. So ships like the BMM with its shops and ability to move in and out of atmosphere are likely to be a lifeline for a lot of player and NPC settlements, turning up to provide a market selling useful goods to the occupants and buying up whatever they're producing. Ships are also going to be very important in identifying valuable land and highlights that you don't necessarily need to be a builder to get involved in the overall game loops around land and building. So in the SICKON 2947 presentation, the team specifically mentioned the importance of exploration ships like the Terrapin, 315P and Carrick. I guess we can now add the Odyssey to that list as well. But with that in mind, it's interesting to note that Tony Z talks about how advanced scanning tech will enable explorers to garner higher amounts of knowledge about an asset. And as we saw from his bit about knowledge, it's the knowledge which determines the ultimate price paid for land. Uh, so with this in mind, it's interesting to sort of just think about sort of how important uh, advanced scanners are going to be on exploration ships. Tony says that maximising the knowledge will require getting all the way to a spot taking core samples and seismographic surveys, uh, but you could use advanced scanners, sort of he talks about tweaking some of the scans to, uh, to fetch more information. So maybe you'll be able with a ship with decent scanners to discern enough info to fetch a good price without having to necessarily take the time to travel all the way into a spot, and that might be a really good way to min-max your profits as an explorer. Finally, I think without getting into blue sky territory really, it's uh, fairly safe to say that there's a lot of space for other dedicated construction vessels. Simply put, the Pioneer is going to be out of reach for many citizens, both in-game and as a pledge. And it just doesn't make sense to me that you only have a massive capital ship capable of building any structures. You know, you wouldn't hire a massive crane just to build yourself a log cabin in the woods. So moving on to what land can be used for by players, let's split this into two categories, confirmed and implied. So a quick disclaimer, this is just based on what has been said by the devs in various presentations and it could always change. But we'll start with the confirmed section. So in terms of player industry, there's been a lot of talk around mining and refining, with the ability to place mineral and gas extractors, probably like those that we see at locations in Stanton like HDMS Bezdeck on Ariel and refineries being talked about and featured in artwork through numerous presentations on building. Chris mentioned in the ATV that resources will be persistent, so even if you find a really rich seam of minerals as you mine, it's going to run down over time, and you may ultimately be forced to abandon your claim and hunt for another. 
Farming and agriculture should also be a feature, with numerous mentions of hydroponics units. Check out locations in Stanton like Bountiful Harvest Hydroponics on Daymar to see what these might have in store. Based on some of the features I've seen on the Endeavour, climate and distance to the sun is going to play a big part in what crops you can grow, and obviously you're going to have a selection of legal and somewhat shady options as a farmer. So speaking of shady activities, drug labs are another option for those in search of the Space Escobar experience. Of course, not all drug labs need to be of the illegal variety. With the new medical gameplay, we know there's going to be demand for pharmaceutical products in games. If you've uh, been taking part in JT2, you'll know you can head to Jump Town on Yella or Paradise Cove on Lyria to check out drug labs in game at the moment. Trading outposts feature quite prominently, and as we get further into the game's development with more remote locations, these will probably be an important piece of the economic puzzle. So if you haven't seen it, check out the CitizenCon 2951 presentation featuring the gameplay walkthrough to see one of the new trade outposts in Pyro for an idea of what those might look like. Uh, medical stations were also mentioned in Todd Pappy's presentation, and it wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to envision enterprising players setting up entire hospitals on the surface of planets. Again, this could be a particularly profitable niche if you're a long way from civilization particularly with the new medical gameplay and death of a spaceman looming. Moving on to the employed category, which I'd just build up from the types of buildings we've seen. Um, you could have a dedicated warehouse, so there are definitely a number of storage options for bulk goods and liquids and gases. And potentially you may wish to have a storage solution close to key markets, allowing you to either prepare goods for transport to the, the ultimate destination, or maybe if you wanted to wait for prices to recover after a crash. Uh, forward operating bases are another one I'd, I'd highlight, either from a combat or an exploration perspective. Having a secure base out of which you can operate on a planet or a moon might be a good option. And there were definitely sort of assets featured like planetary scanners, uh, which could also be useful. But bringing in a large ground force for a combat operation using ships like the Liberator could prove quite risky if you drop too close to a hot zone. So you're going to want somewhere more safe and secure to land your larger ships and to act as a logistical hub. Finally, I'd consider speculating on land. Uh, speculating in the financial sense as opposed to the blue sky sense. Some players might purely discover the land, identify the resources and claim without any intention to see the whole loop through. Instead, they could purely speculate on the land and look to flip it to another player or organisation who have the intention to fully mine the resources, etc. Chris also mentioned in the ATV that players might be able to lease or rent land, so some players with the title on certain land could potentially take the role of landlords. You might even take the role of a property developer. Since land is tradable, you could always claim or buy virgin land, build the facilities for it to be profitably exploited and sell it on for a markup, leaving another player or org to operate the asset and freeing up a lump sum of cash for you to invest in your next project. So I've purposely been trying to limit the amount of opinion and speculation I put into this because I figure we can just get too far into blue sky thinking when it comes to concepts like land and building in Star Citizen. However, having suppressed my opinions for most of the videos, I did want to close out with just a few of my views on the future of land and building. Uh, but if that's not for you, feel free to uh, skip to the end or, or turn off now. Okay, you're still here. Uh, so the first one I'd say is that while it would be really good to have land claim mechanics extensively tested in beta, I'd personally delay actually implementing them until a little while after a live release. I love the idea of this land rush that the team mentioned frequently. I feel that players should have a level playing field before being able to do something as important as claim land. CIG have quite rightly highlighted that land isn't exactly lacking in Star Citizen. Uh, Jared comments in the ATV special that if all of the, at that time, 1.9 million citizens had a land claim, they could fit them all onto just one planet. So even though we're a bit further on than that, you know, two planets. However, premium land surely can't be that common. A lot of the pay-to-win elements of SC don't bother me too much. You know, there's always going to be someone out there with a bigger ship than you. And the model of selling ships helps fund the game. But for some reason, personally, the idea of a relative few players having a big head start in something as important as a land grab rubs me the wrong way. So I personally find the answers in the Q&A on UE land claim licenses a bit weak and uh, I hope that as we get closer to getting these mechanics in-game there is some consideration given to how this will look. 
my second one is that I personally believe the most valuable land should be in lawless zones. If you've watched my channel before, you might have picked up that I see a decent amount of read across between EVE and SE in terms of the end MMORPG. While I think there should be opportunities across the spectrum of systems with different levels of security, I think the biggest reward should lie outside of the safety net of the Empire. This should provide a solid end game for orcs with certain territory being strongly contested. And as an aside from this, I think land should have the potential to be very well protected from attacks by ships. One of the uh, suckiest, official term, parts of games like Ark Survival is just waking up, logging in and finding that your base has a hole in it through which all of your good loot left. I believe that ground bases should have the potential to be effectively impervious to attack from the air. Ships like the A2 seem to almost be exclusively designed to pancake carefully crafted bases, and this will just put people off. I also feel this is a great opportunity to bring a necessity to land-based combat. A big part of the lore in things like Warhammer 40k and Star Wars is that planetary shields can effectively withstand any form of aerial or orbital bombardment, making ground assault to knock out those shields a prerequisite to that type of attack. And finally, I'd say that land should be relatively costly to upkeep. So in the Sitcon 2957 panel, they brought up that there'll be this element of wear and tear, determined by the atmosphere of the place that you put your base in. And this implies that you'll need to maintain your bases. Personally, I hope this takes the form of more than just credits, and you would have to physically bring different materials and parts in to repair your outpost. That would also sort of help force players to play together, which for me is one of the best things about Star Citizen. A quick caveat here that I think this should be a scale. You know, if you just want to build a little homestead on a nice parcel of land next to a pretty lake, I don't think you should have to worry too much about upkeep. Um, however, if your land is a significant money maker or strategic plot, then it should cost a hefty sum to upkeep. I think this could take two forms, you know, both in the wear and tear upkeep, with more buildings equaling a greater cost, and or in the form of taxation based on the value of the land which in turn would increase as you, for instance, placed a refinery on it. Bringing in an element of cost will help to keep land mechanics grounded in semi-reality and prevent them just being a way to passively generate tons of credits without putting any thought in. So, I hope this was an interesting deep dive into land mechanics. As a veteran of many a survival game, I'm extremely excited for land and building mechanics and I can't wait to try and build you know, a city with with the guys over at Frontier Consolidated. I also really enjoyed researching for this video, and even though I've been following the project for a while, I realised there was a bunch of stuff here that I either missed or had forgotten about entirely. If you do like this type of thing, then please let me know. I think there are a number of aspects of SC that we could give this treatment to if it's of interest to you. And with that in mind, if you enjoyed the vid and think I've earned it, then please consider hitting that subscribe button and maybe sharing this with your friends and org mates. It does really help me out a ton. A special thank you as always to my Patreons. If you would like to go the extra mile to support the channel, then the link's just down in the description. But honestly, just being here is more than enough. And with all that said, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.